This week's message, given by Pastor Stephen Yun at the Sarkisani United Methodist Church, October 15th, 2023. The message is, Living the Parables of God's Economy, Talents, based on Matthew 25, 14 to 30. Our gospel lesson today, and I ask that you stand for the gospel reading, from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey, and the man who had received the five bags of gold went out once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with the two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. <coughs> After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to be here with you. Would you join me as I pray? Loving gracious God, we come to you asking for your divine food, the water that will quench our thirst. Where else could we go, oh God? As we turn to this world, we hear all the voices and words that make us way down. This morning we return to you source of our strength, the bread of life. Feed our soul with your life-giving word so we can live our life with the power and the strength that you give us. May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So a physicist, an engineer, an economist are stranded in the desert and they are extremely hungry. Luckily they found a can of corn 
Now they uh, want to open it but how? The physicist says, let's start a fire and place the can inside the flames. He will explore, I mean explode, and then we will all be able to eat it. Are you crazy? Says the engineer. All the corn will burn and scatter and we won't be able to eat. We should use a metal wire, attach it to a base and push it and crack the uh, can open. After hearing that, the economist says these words. It's unbelievable what you guys are saying. Most of you are wrong. Where can we find the metal wire in the desert? The solution is simple. Let's assume we have a can opener. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> Say the joke. <laughs> it was a joke, by the way. <laughs> In this story, you've got physicists, those folks who like to roll with scientific principles and experiments, and there are these engineers, practical minds who know their way around tools. Now, here's the economist. They sometimes get a little bit of a reputation for making things sound all fancy and uh, assuming stuff in their models. In this story, the economist goes, hey, let's just assume there is a can opener, even if it's not one inside. It's like they're in their own world, kind of disconnected from the uh, real world. But here's the thing. Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, had a similar approach in his teaching. Many of his teachings, Jesus would come up with hypothetical but real life assumptions, scenarios. And the key difference is that they were closely tied to the real world. They were not detached from the practical realities. His stories were down-to-earth parables that his disciples could grasp, and they're still, you know, uh, making a profound impact on us as Christians, as we try to understand the principles and values of God's kingdom, and how God guides the material and spiritual aspect of our lives. As we engage in this year's stewardship program, I'd like us to explore the three parables of Jesus in the Gospel that will help us understand how God's economy works in our lives, in our world. When we talk about economy today, we are basically talking about how things get made, distributed, bought, in a specific area or country. It's all about how stuff is produced and distributed and how people use it. But do you know the word economy originally derived from the Greek word in the New Testament, which is oikonomia, the Greek word oikonomia. The word oikonomia is the combination of two Greek words, which together means the management of a household. The management of household. And the word steward also came from this Greek word, oikonomia. So what's the role of a steward? We think about the role of steward. It's all about managing someone's resources and properties. In simpler terms, the term economy originally describes the concept of stewardship. It points us to the connection between healthy stewardship and healthy, responsible stewardship and healthy economy. In other words, healthy economy is not possible without realizing what healthy stewardship is all about. The healthy economy is not possible without realizing the fundamental truth that everything in the universe, including our resources, our talents and time and treasures, was created by God and entrusted to us. This means that in this world, we are all stewards of God. And Jesus reminds us of, the, of this fundamental truth through his 
well-known parable, the parable of the talents. It's the story about three servants and their master who was heading out on a trip. You know, the master got these three servants and he wants them to take care of his money called talent. In this uh, biblical translation says a uh, bag of gold. But in a uh, Greek word, it's talent. Each servant gets a different amount based on their ability. One of them gets five talents. Another gets two. And the last one gets one. In this story, Jesus doesn't say anything about what these servants did with the talent that they received. But he does fast forward and tells what happens after the master comes back from his trip. The master checks in on his servants. The first two servants who invested their talents present the master with 100% increase. You know, they double what they had received. They were super excited and gave it all back to the master. But now comes the twist. The third servant, as we all know, the one who only got one talent, didn't do anything with it. Well, technically, he did one thing. What did, what did he do? He dug a hole in the ground and buried it. And now gives the boast back the same single talent. The master is not happy about it. You know, he calls the first to serve a good and faithful servant. Now what does he say to this third servant? Lazy and wicked. Lazy and wicked for not doing anything with the talent. To top, top it up, he takes that one talent away for the third servant and gives it to one of the uh, two. You know, I first heard this parable when I was in Sunday school. I was very young. Probably I heard this story more than 100 times as I grew up. But at some point, I realized that this parable didn't sit well with me. There was something uneasy, something uncomfortable about this parable especially in how the master treats the third servant. Why would the master be so harsh toward the third servant? At least he didn't lose what he received, right? The master didn't lose his principle. Perhaps I identify closely with this third servant in terms of my personality and my style. But imagine your boss entrusted you with a million dollars. I know many of you retired already, but just imagine your imaginary boss gave you a million dollars and asked you to invest until he or she returns. By the way, that's roughly the amount of money that the third servant received from his master. You know, one talent would be uh, roughly equivalent to 16, 20 years of wages for the average worker. So given the U.S. median household income, one talent, which is 20 years of income again, uh, would be close to a million dollars. That's a lot of money. So how would you feel if you received a, a million dollars from your boss? Well, it depends on who you are and who your boss is. If your boss is an investor, Wall Street, if you are a PM, a portfolio manager, to invest a million dollars is a piece of cake. You know, you, as a PM, you would handle multiple million dollars. But if you don't have any background in finance, or if you have no experience of investing money, this will be a challenging, burdensome task. It will be a very overwhelming task. I read an article written by a financial educator named Gracie Pomroy, who works with uh, many Christians. She meets a lot of people who are financially anxious in his job, in her job, and they're so nervous about doing the wrong thing with their money. So what happens is that they end up doing nothing with the money they have. And when she looks at the third servant in, the, in this parable, she sees a financially anxious person. Maybe some of us. And she feels 
uh, she's filled with uh, compassion for them. The same for the, the third servant in the, in the story. So first of all, let me clarify. I believe this story was not told for modern day Christians to determine how best to get a return on investment. You know, some Christian investors would like to read the story like that. But in the context of Matthew's Gospel, this talent, this treasure entrusted by the Master refers to the Gospel we preached and lived out by our Lord Jesus Christ. It refers to the Gospel lived out by our Lord Jesus Christ through His life, ministry, death, and resurrection. And the first two servants represent those faithful disciples who hear the gospel, act on them. So the third servant wasn't simply the one who lacked the knowledge of how to invest, but those who hear the gospel but didn't act on the gospel. Friends, this insight leads us to the question, what are we doing with the talent given by God? In other words, how are we acting on the gospel of Jesus? What are we doing to further the gospel of Jesus in our lives, in our world? Because this is why God has entrusted us with the talents. In this case, the talent refers to our gifts, resources, time, ability that we use to further God's kingdom, to further the gospel of Jesus Christ in this church, in this community, in this world. Friends, from a perspective of God's economy, we are God's stewards. We are God's portfolio manager. To put it another way, we are God's PM in a spiritual sense, not in a capitalist sense. This means that God first invested in us. God first invested in us. And we are also expected to invest for God and for God's kingdom, for the gospel of Jesus. We're called to take care of God's kingdom business until Jesus returns. You know what the greatest challenge as we pursue this mission? The greatest challenge is to deal with the sense of fear. Just like the third servant had to deal with it. Going back to the story was the fear that prevented the third servant from using the talents that had been entrusted to him. We know how fear interferes with our endeavors. How fear can paralyze our God-sized vision, God-given ability. I know a young man uh, who couldn't go to college pursued his dream because of his fear. He was afraid that he couldn't manage it financially. You know, many churches have settled in to serve only a fraction of people in the community because its members were afraid to risk expanding their building or their parking lot. It's hard to believe, but that's reality for some many churches. As Harry Emerson Fostick said, fear paralyzes while faith empowers. Fear imprisons while faith liberates. Some of us might argue that the man should not be blamed for having his fears. You know, fear, having fear is not a sin to begin with, right? But to live with fear all the time, to live with fear prevents us from accomplishing God's purposes and potentials. I'm grateful that our church, Sakasana Sana UMC, is blessed with people who are not afraid to use their talents. We're blessed with people who possess a variety of different God-given talents. Some members of our church family have a talent for music, whether it's a singing or playing musical instruments, like our praise band, our 
our Chen supplier. Their contribution greatly enriched our worship experience and lift us spiritually. We are fortunate to have church family members who are techn technologically savvy and, and uh, knowledgeable, enabling us to use all the uh, technology resources and live stream our services for those who are worshiping from home. Others among us are gifted in caring and hospitality, offering their time for visiting and serving and welcoming fellow churchgoers. Additionally, we have church members with financial expertise who play a crucial role in planning and ensuring the financial health of our congregation. Some of our church family members are gifted in communication and teaching, serving as lay servants and Sunday school teachers, small group leaders. We're also grateful for those with incredible handy skills such as our trustees. See these wonderful technology that we're using for our worship. I was amazed by their skills, their knowledge to make this project possible. There are also individuals with talents in organizing, coordinating various aspects of our church activities and ministries. Our church is blessed with individuals with talents in photography, writing, cooking, coaching, gardening, crafting prayer shows, decorating altar with flowers, to name just a few. So that these talents represent only a fraction of many talents, skills, and abilities within our congregation. The list goes on and on. As a pastor, it's a truly a blessing to witness the abundance of gifts and talents our congregation possesses. And be willing to share. So I some of you have see is blessed with the array of talents, a wonderful gift from God. The question for us as God's steward is how we invest these talents to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. How we invest these talents for God's kingdom. What's amazing about these talents is that when you commit to use your talent for God, for His church, you become part of God's redemptive activity. What is called the Missio Dei, the mission of God. You become part of God's mission by using your talents. Even if it's a little thing, a little ability you yourself may not necessarily consider a talent. When you commit and obey to use it for God, it becomes an opportunity for transformation, both personal and communal. It changes us, it changes people around us, it changes the world. That's the work of our God who fed 5,000 people with two fish and two loaves of bread, as we read in the Gospel. Friends, each of you here at SUMC got talent just because God first invested in you. So the question for us is not whether we have received talents from God, but whether and how we are using it. It is not about how gifted we are, but how we are gifted and what we are gifted for. If fear gets in the way in your spiritual life today, friends, just listen carefully. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the little saying, fear knocked at the door, faith answered, and no one was there. How many of you are familiar with this little saying? Faith answered. No one was there when fear knocked at the door. When fear tries to hold you and paralyzes you, think about who is responding. What is answering within you? Psychologists tell us that we often interpret new information in a way that aligns with our internal narratives, internal stories. The stories that we tell about ourselves, the stories that we tell others all the time. But the stories of Jesus 
especially found in the scriptures, are the stories that have power to change, transform our internal narratives. It changes our internal stories. These are the stories that God calls us to live by. The stories that we should live by. The stories that guide our hearts, our actions, our lives. So friends, as we leave today, let's not merely the hearers of the gospel, but doers of it. Let us embrace our talents and respond to fear with faith and align our narratives with the transformative stories of Jesus. For it is through living out these stories that we honor our Creator, the Divine Giver, the Divine Investor, and bring light and love into a world that so desperately needs it. Amen.